as Southeast Asia welcomes a new generation of digital consumers, how will technology creators meet the challenges of building for personas that have otherwise been left behind, both digitally and financially? Amanda Sabri, CEO of Dapat Vista, leads a team of passionate Malaysians with a unique process process of understanding what financially excluded personas need in order to transact online. Hint, it goes far beyond a fancy user interface. Ladies and gentlemen, Amanda will be coming up next, so please stay tuned and we will be back shortly. Hello Malaysia. I am Amanda Sabri, CEO of DAPAT, a Pertama digital portfolio company. Today, I am going to tell you how the future of our Malaysian society relies on the design decisions we make today. Big statement, right? Stay with me. I want you to begin by picturing this. You had a really long day at the office. You were super productive, had a few wins and a few losses too. You're now in your car on the highway taking a relaxing drive home to have dinner with the family. Except, it's not so relaxing. Traffic is absolutely manic. Cars are blocking up yellow boxes and cutting across double lines. You wince, but it's manageable. After all, this is just part and parcel of traveling during rush hour. Then you come to a toll booth. You have a tag, so you're looking forward to a smooth clearance. It's the cashless, savvy choice that you're proud of. You are not like other road users. You are going to be ahead. But no, there's a long queue on the rightmost lane. A blue car is stuck at the barrier. The dot matrix display screams, Tia de Tag. First, the blue car goes into a series of back and forth maneuvers in hopes of getting detected. Finally, the poor driver gives up. The blue car goes into reverse, starting a chain reaction with all nine cars behind it having to back up too. Now the blue car cuts three lanes to the left to make a cash payment, slicing three lanes of oncoming traffic, like a disaster waiting to happen. Meanwhile, the nine cars, they get cleared one by one until car number seven. This time, a red car. The dot matrix display screams, Baki Kurang. Once again, the snake of cars go into reverse in some weird, coordinated, backwards party train dance. This time, you blow your top. The frustration level is high. Why can't these drivers mount their tags properly? Why can't they check their balance before driving off? Why are you being penalised for their mistakes? And why has it been like this for 20 years? Why? Now, all this while you're sitting in a state-of-the-art car with radar cruise control, a heads-up display, an intelligent navigation that understands your voice commands and tells you when there is debris on the road, the air conditioning is just perfect, and your car has been very reliable, not like that car you own in the year 1999. When your spouse calls you, you answer the call hands-free, and he hears your voice crystal clear thanks to noise-canceling microphones in the car. What a contrast, right? This isn't unique to cars and toll booths. It's happening all around us. Now, our Asia-Pacific region has led the world in both private and public digitalization since the start of the pandemic. We have accelerated digital adoption by more than 10 years over just the first seven months of 2020. We have a plethora of cutting-edge apps right in our hands that are magically updated and improved while we sleep, making them an absolute pleasure to use and depend on in our new digitally-enabled lives. In Southeast Asia, we have seen 40 million new users come online in just one year, compared to an average of 25 million over the preceding four years. 70% of our region is now online. One in three digital service users are new thanks to the pandemic. And nine in 10 of them are sticking to digital for life. By 2025, every Malaysian, even a day old infant, will have a smartphone. And that infant will likely have a 4G mobile broadband connection 
with a 97% penetration rate. Now that includes our rural communities, which made up 59% of new digital consumers in Malaysia over the course of COVID-19. Yes, I know, those are a lot of numbers, but it all comes down to this one fact. Malaysia has landed squarely in the digital age today. Okay, so we're all digital now, right? Let's go on our way, becoming Bitcoin millionaires while we have Zoom socials and get ice cream delivered, right? Why not let's spend 10 million on an NFT while we're at it? Are we going to live happily ever after? Well, not all of us. The truth is, this great digital acceleration has been a boom for some of us, while others are left behind. Our penetration rates are high, 32 million smartphones, 96% have mobile internet, 92% of adults with an active deposit account, while half of the poorest 40% amongst us, the B40s, receive their wages in cash. In fact, 3.7 million adults in the private sector still receive their wages in cash. Now this reliance on cash then permeates the payment space. Four out of five Malaysian utility bill payers still do so in cash. Let's put this into some context. Go to any Pasamalam, not just in rural areas, but also right here in Klang Valley. But leave your wallet at home. No cash, no cards. Just take your smartphone with an e-wallet account. How many items can you actually buy? From our research, very little, and for a variety of reasons. Some as simple as the fact that some stallholders believe that they have to print out their QR codes to receive payments, when in fact, they can display it on their smartphone screens. Now this experience demonstrates a couple of loopholes in our digital journey as a nation. First and foremost, Malaysians are amongst the most active social media users in the world. We are ahead of South Korea in time spent on Facebook, YouTube, and e-commerce. Clearly, as a people, we know how to produce and consume digital content. We are using our broadband-connected smartphones for entertainment, socializing, and perhaps retail therapy. Now, these trends are true across the board at every social economic segment in Malaysia. Second, for some of our fellow men, the value proposition for making the leap into digital financial services is not hitting the spot right now. And so the default means of transaction is a lot more comfortable, which is cash. So it is entirely possible for an individual to have hundreds of likes on Instagram, but rarely make e-payments living an almost entirely cash-based life. Now, the last loophole I'd like to highlight is what seems to be an opportunity missed by the B40s, to leverage digital tools effectively to achieve social economic mobility, which we, within the Pertama Digital Group, have coined as digital productivity. All this while you and I, the M40s and T20s, ride this wave of digital acceleration to live our best lives with heightened productivity and the luxury of working remotely. What does all this mean for us as a society? We are going to have to mind the gap, the socio-economic gap, the one that grows when there's income inequality, as the rich get richer and the rest get left behind. This gap has a negative impact on many facets of our societal fabric, from health to housing. The pandemic has amplified some of these problems, not just in Malaysia, but across the globe. There are entire industries on the back foot with no recovery in sight. All of a sudden, so many of us are going to have to make ends meet in a new normal with weakened job security and a need to fend for ourselves and our families. This has led to a self-employment explosion in Malaysia. In 2018, there were 2.9 million self-employed Malaysians, making up about 20% of the workforce. According to data from the statistics department during our recent MCOs, nearly 50% of self-employed Malaysians lost their jobs, while 90% are getting by on a reduced income. And after a year of wearing masks and physical distancing, 
The self-employed have depleted their savings, accumulated debt, and are now dealing with overall lower consumer spending. Winter is coming. What will these challenges mean for our society? How long will it take for us to shrug off the stains of COVID-19 over the 2020s? What can we do to not only brace ourselves, but also extend enabling initiatives to those who need it most? To start solving these problems, we first need to understand exactly who is experiencing the highest magnitude of pain from being financially excluded. Financial exclusion refers to individuals, businesses, and populations without access to common financial services. Now, this may include savings accounts, um, formal loans, cashless transactions, credit, and other banking services that you and I take for granted. Bank Negara Malaysia, in its widely praised licensing framework for digital banks published in December 2020, has highlighted that our financially excluded Malaysians may face challenges obtaining financial services due to higher information asymmetry and a higher risk profile. This, in turn, may be due to a lack of credit history, loan collateral, or just a consistent form of income. Our self-employed friends fall squarely in this category. You see, banks want to help them. In fact, they are in the business of lending money for a variety of purposes in order to make a profit. However, banks also owe a duty to depositors as well as the wider economy to manage risks responsibly and ensure the long-term stability of their operations. Now, in order to be financially viable while managing risks, banks apply a framework of checks and requirements to assess how a potential customer would fit into their overall risk-reward appetite. Now, these frameworks typically translate into formal processes, advanced terminology, and a wide range of financial products and services which can be difficult to navigate. Now, and this is completely responsible and required of the banks. They are heavily regulated and have years of experience as providers of financial services in good times and in bad, having to forecast cycles of volatility and consider a wide range of possible events that could trigger a banking disaster. In short, it's not personal. On the other hand, those of us who would benefit most from financial services in times of need may be time and resource poor, with a low level of financial literacy and limited understanding of formal processes. Even when we do qualify for financial products from banks, how many of us actually understand how they work, our liabilities, and the long-term implications on our households? This isn't the only information gap. How many of us know exactly how banks make decisions about us? How do we build a credit profile? What kind of activity banks need to see on our accounts in order to serve us? We are all affected by this in some way, but the self-employed are disproportionately represented. This group includes your friendly food delivery guy, local Instagram cookie seller, and the guy who comes around to your house to cut grass, a gig economy worker, MSME, and cash service providers. So the big question is, Seeing that 92% of Malaysian adults have an active deposit bank account, why do the financially underserved exist among us? Why are they not fitting the mold that banks have set? Why is e-wallet usage growing exponentially while leaving gaps on the ground? What's the missing piece? Is there something we don't know but ought to? The answer is yes, there is a huge missing piece that we see across the board in not just Malaysia, but in other countries too, with such a diverse landscape of people. It is something that I feel extremely passionate about and I believe will be a key piece in how we recover from this pandemic as a nation. The answer is described in just two words. Customer experience. Customer experience. More specifically, the answer lies in service providers of all shapes and sizes, from tech startups to conglomerates and incumbent banks. Focusing on designing great customer experiences for Malaysians of all walks of life. Customer experience design is simply a commitment to building products with a laser focus on the customer. Let's start with the understanding between us that everything is designed. The screen you are watching me on 
has been designed. Your experience when you walk into Starbucks, from the temperature of the cafe to how your name is scribbled on the cup, has been designed. This is an example I like to use to illustrate customer experience. Now think of your last cereal breakfast. The products were cereal and milk. The interfaces were the spoon and the bowl. And the experience was your enjoyment of the meal. The combination of cereal and cold milk in a bowl of just the right size and a spoon that balances well in between your fingers. An experience is an orchestra of elements that come together. Teams of highly skilled people have spent months and years creating exactly what keeps you going back to your favorite brands for more. Now in 2018, PwC reported that 32% of bad experiences resulted in users not coming back to a brand or product. A single bad experience could cause a customer to abandon a service completely. So this is high stakes. So let's make everything pretty. Hold on. Let's take a moment to understand this. What's so cool about making something pretty? What impact could it make? I'm here to tell you that customer experience can change the world as we know it. The design of a customer experience has the power to influence people. It is about psychology, research, and taking a complex problem and breaking it down into smaller, more digestible pieces. In fact, customer experience is an ancient art and can be traced back to ancient China. Feng Shui is the positioning of an environment to bring positivity. It is about designing experiences for the people that would occupy a physical space. More recently, our friends in Silicon Valley have been spending billions of dollars tailoring our individual and collective experiences in digital environments. It's no coincidence that as a country, we love social media. Enough to spend an average of five hours and 47 minutes a day on it. That's like watching two Lord of the Rings movies back to back every single day. Our experiences as users of YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, and WhatsApp have been designed to the last pixel to keep us coming back for more. Unfortunately, there is a dark side to this, which is now coming to light after more than a decade of smartphone ownership. This arises from the fact that these apps have been making design decisions based on driving engagement metrics, whether or not they are in the best interest of us, the customers. You are the product. Their value is your attention. Your five hours and 47 minutes drives their bottom line. It's okay. Most of us are perfectly comfortable engaging with these free services because we derive value from them. We want to keep in touch with loved ones and be entertained. We want to work better and be informed. But how much is too much? We are now beginning to see the disastrous effects of misaligned customer experience design. Get this. Out of 790,000 American divorces, 33% of them blame Facebook. Yes, customer experience design really has the power to ruin marriages. Great customer experience is addictive and it ignites a primal emotional reaction, fear of missing out. What this demonstrates is a lack of broader thinking on the part of customer experience designers linked to short-term KPIs that aren't quite equitable. It is time to make a change and think, what's, the, what's in the best interest of the customer and a society? It's time to design for Malaysians, especially those who are left behind. As creators of solutions, we must design for their needs, their dreams, their wishes, and their purpose. Our product should be a part of what they want to help them fulfill their purpose and live better lives, to reach their full potential. We need to create experiences that don't smother you with ads, promos, games, points, coins, but instead wait for you, ready exactly for when you need it. At Dapat and Pertama Digital, we design products that are usable, inclusive, equitable, enjoyable, and useful. Let's break that down. To begin, customer experience is about improving usability or making something easier to use. This means that the design structure and purpose of the product must be clear to everyone. Think about a chili sauce bottle. Historically, chili sauce comes in a glass bottle. 
we had to hit the bottom of the glass to make the sauce come out. Often, no sauce or too much sauce will come out of the bottle. Today, the sauce bottle has been redesigned into a plastic squeezable bottle, which makes it easier to use and allows us to control how much sauce actually comes out. Customer experience designers need to think about every person who uses the product, including those who speak other languages, those with disabilities, and people with very different life experiences from your own, like the financially underserved. Considering the unique needs of many different people is important work. And thinking about equitable design is key. Being inclusive and equitable means your designs are useful and marketable to people with diverse abilities and backgrounds. Customer experience is also about making things enjoyable to use, which creates a positive connection between user and the product. Customer experience designers foster that positive connection by taking a user's thoughts and feelings into account when making products. Think about ordering food delivery online. When you search for a restaurant in Google or Food Panda, you can see photos of dishes and read reviews from other people who have eaten there. The experience is enjoyable because you can make a more informed choice about what to order, leaving you feeling happier about the product. So how do we figure out what makes a customer happy with the product? That's where research comes in. To know how users feel, we have to collect evidence on how they are experiencing that product in real time and ask them about it if we have to. As humans, we want products that are useful, meaning they must solve our problems. For example, if you're lost, a map app telling you how to get home is very useful. But if the app can't find your current location, it doesn't become so useful anymore. Studies show that regardless of industry, businesses that focus on good usability and design perform better than their competitors. Basically, it comes down to this. When people like a product, they use that product a lot and they recommend it to their friends, and more people using the product means better business. Let's think of some local products in this context. When is the last time you recommended a business, app, or service to a friend based purely on your positive personal experience with it? These days, we are used to promoting services based on promo codes and incentives. Here's a top tip. Truly great products and services do not require incentives to grow organically. Think about it. Did you ever receive a promo code from WhatsApp or Waze? Now I'd like to highlight a key strength that great customer experience designers have, empathy. Empathy is the ability to understand someone else's feelings or thoughts in a situation. And it's a major part of customer experience. Remember earlier when we mentioned inclusive, equitable design and designing for everyone? Well, in order to design for everyone, we need to understand how a person might feel or what they might think in any situation. In markets like Malaysia, Great customer experience is inclusive. Imagine designing software that will be used by Malaysians of all walks of life. Where would you start? Somehow, you have to strike a balance between designing for everyone and for not really anyone. Designing an effective customer experience starts first with a deep understanding of the people involved in the usage of the planned product. This can't be done from behind an office desk you have to get out into the real world and live where your customers are for as long as it takes for you to see things from their perspective. For example, if you're designing a solution for an MSME, go and spend time working in a few of them. Witness how difficult it is to manage. What happens when it rains and a QR code is not laminated? While you're there, conduct stakeholder interviews, create user personas, and write detailed stories about the potential use cases of your solution. Now, don't be surprised when you come back to the office with a completely different concept of your product. Next, share your findings with your team. Together, brainstorm ideas, sketch wireframes, and understand engineering constraints, if any. Take those sketches back to the ground. Go back to your potential customers and show them your ideas. Involve them in the creation of their solution. Speak their language. Gain their trust. You're not just another tech capitalist looking to be the next big thing. You then create the minimum viable product and test it with a small group of customers. Stay close to them, record comments, hurdles, 
frustrations. Bring these back to the team and make small changes at a time. Now, by going through this process for each and every product and feature your business creates, you will be on the right track to creating customer experiences that deliver real value to those who need it most. Dapat did that just with eJamin, our digital bail payment solution. Bail is a deposit for the courts as security to ensure the accused attends criminal court proceedings. Failure to pay lands the accused in lockup or prison pending case conclusion. Now, on the face of it, it looks like a really simple solution. However, in the background, there has now been years of efforts put into this simple solution as we work closely with the innovative team at the Malaysian judiciary and the dedicated civil servants that power the hundreds of courts of law across the country, ensuring we have an efficient judicial system at all times. Now, traditionally, bailers had to brave the traffic from the court to the bank and wait through queues to open a bank account. Then, they had to rush back to the court to place the bail. All this under the pressure of time, because if bail is not paid by the late afternoon on the same day, the accused would have to spend time in the lockup or prison. Our process saw us diving deep into the personas of every stakeholder involved, from both sides of the bench. It was only then that we managed to design a customer experience for bailers, court officers, magistrates, and senior stakeholders that benefited from strong organic adoption and the trust and belief of accused individuals and their families. As you can imagine, anybody who finds himself in the position of having to pay bail for a loved one is, in un is under absolute pressure. It is a high stakes environment and any solution has to work absolutely perfectly. Otherwise, there is a real risk of insurmountable disappointment from the customer. So eJamin had to be quick and easy to use by a wide subsection of Malaysians for a crucial purpose in a time-sensitive environment while having to build absolute trust in bailers that the system will indeed work and not let them down. It was really a tall order, but we succeeded. As a digital ba bail payment solution, eJamin enabled the Rakyat to complete the bail payment process in 15 minutes, down from the previous three hours or more, all done on the spot via a smartphone or web browser. eJamin was also timely because the expedited and touchless bail payment customer experience helped avoid long queues at the courts and the banks. Now, both DAPAT and the Malaysian judiciary committed to building a solution that benefits the Rakyat first and foremost in their moment of difficulty. Now, this spirit permeated across the board with court officers voluntarily attending online seminars about financial literacy and customer experience in order to better serve the rakyat. Some of these seminars in rural courts have resulted in a 10 times growth in digital bail payments within the month. Now, how's that for financial inclusion, right? So if we, the innovators of Malaysia, spent a bit more time building usable, inclusive, equitable, enjoyable, and useful products for our fellow citizens, what would the future look like? My prediction is that we will pull out of this pandemic stronger together with products and solutions that have the potential to change lives. Customer experience will be a key component of the facilitation of social economic mobility over a generation. The patriots at Dapat and Pertama Digital are building equitable, impactful solutions for the Rakyat so we can do our part to support our Malaysia digital economy blueprint. I invite you to get in touch with my team at dapat.com to brainstorm ideas around customer experience and how we can work together. We will do our part to make customer experience design thinking go mainstream so that one day queues at toll booths will be a thing of the past. Thank you.